Hi guys. Uh, thanks for joining us here today. I'm Taylor Moreland. I'm the owner of Agri Spray Drones. So today we are going to answer uh, the age old question, the question that we get asked all the time. How do I start a business using sprayer drones um, and specifically a custom application business? So a business where you can offer your services um, applying products uh, to farm fields or to other types uh, of applications. So we're gonna to attempt to try to answer this in a pretty short period of time, because really when you wanna dive into this fully, you can spend uh, days, you know, weeks trying to solve this problem, answer this question. But what we're gonna to try to do is look at a specific example, look at application services here in the Midwest, something that we are very familiar with. We've sold uh, hundreds of drones across North America. Uh, the bulk of those are in the Midwest in row crop operations. And the bulk of those uh, uh, folks that have bought those drones from us are doing custom application um, services in their area. So we know this, uh, this industry very well. We ourselves um, are actually uh, custom application providers um, for our little neck of the woods here in Centralia, Missouri. And so we're gonna focus on this, uh, this type of application in terms of starting a business with, uh, with drones and um, then We'll see if we can uh, answer some of you guys' questions along the way. So if you have questions during the presentation, please drop them in the chat um, on the sidebar there. We'll answer them at the end. So this is just an overview of some of the big questions to answer. Uh, if you're thinking about this uh, as a business, then this is kind of what we think. Or maybe with some questions you should answer before you uh, buy a drone yourself and get started. And we'll attempt to answer the, some of these through the presentation here. So this is what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, I'll start, I'll start, I'll kick it off. We'll basically go over uh, four key points here in getting started with a drone application business. Um, and then we'll jump into what to expect. And here, you're actually gonna hear from a couple of our customers um, who have started a, uh, or done drone application service uh, over this past year. And they have a lot of good experience. You know, it's, it's really good to learn from people who have actually done it and who are very new to it. And so they're gonna provide you some information and then we'll open up for Q&A after that. So first off, kind of the first three bullet points here, research, licensing, and equipment. Uh, we'll jump right into research here. So before you start an application business, you really have to know what you're going to be doing. Uh, that's where the research comes in. And really what it boils down to is knowing what markets are available in your area. So what application markets are available in your area and what, how can drones serve those markets? And if you're new to ag, this can be a little bit difficult. Um, if you're in ag, this can be relatively easy. Um, and I don't really know where everybody fits on the spectrum on this, on this uh, webinar right now. So we're gonna kind of bring it down to basics. Um, drones are aerial application. Uh, if you have seen ground rigs, so the big John Deere sprayers with the booms, 120 foot booms, big, big tanks in the back. The drones are not similar to that at all. Um, and for that reason, you should not think about competing with the same types of applications that ground rigs are doing. Um, what I mean by that is if a local service provider, uh, a co-op or a retailer is offering an application service using a ground rig, you know, applying herbicide, then you probably should not compete with them applying herbicide. And this is really the main thing that ground rigs do across the Midwest here is herbicide application. And drones don't really have a great fit for this uh, for a few reasons. Label is one reason. Um, and then you know, when you think about the value that drones offer, the aerial application value, um, that's huge right there. And so if you have to compete on price with the ground rig, then you have to cut that value down, which it makes no sense really. We'll get into more of this later. Um, so. Drones are aerial application. And if you think about aerial application in your area, that's kind of a place to start. If you have planes, you know, crop dusters that fly in your area, um, you know, find out what, what they're doing and what kind of products that, that they're applying, what times of year they're applying and start there. And then probably a great place to look also is thinking about those niche applications, you know, things that crop dusters can't do. Um, so smaller fields, hilly, hilly fields, spot application, wet areas, um, specialty type applications. These are all great applications for drones. Um, and really kind of when you think about 
uh, air application service in your area, it all boils down to supply and demand, okay? So if you're in an area that has a lot of demand for air application, not a lot of supply, then it's basically take your pick on what you want to do. If you're in an area that has a bunch of supply for air application, then you have to kind of get more targeted. Um, so really, how do you figure out what type of app applications to be doing, to be offering in your area? That's where lo asking local experts is always a great place to start. So how do you find local experts? Uh, ag retailers are a great place to look first. Um, so the relationship between ag retailers, uh, what I mean by ag retailers are uh, you know, places where you buy your seed and your chemical and things like that. So the relationship between ag retailers and aerial applicators in the past um, has been aerial applicators work with the retailers to get acres. So the retailers work with the local farmers and they get a group of 10 or 15 farmers together and they, you know, get you know, 20,000 acres or so lined up for aerial application service. They call a service provider, a, a crop duster, and they come in and they provide that service uh, to the farmer. And basically the, the retailer gets, gets a cut of that. And so retailers don't actually provide the aerial application themselves in almost every case across the Midwest. There are certainly some retailers who do, but the vast majority do not provide aerial application themselves. And so using them as a resource to figure out you know, what their needs are for aerial application, what their customers' needs are, is a great, uh, great place to start. Um, so this is just a, a link here that'll take you to some of the, like the top 100 ag retailers across the U.S., uh, primarily the, the Midwest. And then, of course, uh, we're looking at large farmers, too. Um, if you can provide services directly to farmers in your area, uh, that is a much better way to go, go in my opinion, um, going right to the source. And so finding those large farmers, figuring out what their needs are for air application, um, and then uh, basing your business around that. And these are just some questions to ask um, whenever you, you contact those folks. Okay, so when we get down to the specifics here, when we're talking about uh, you know, our advice when it comes to starting an application business, what market should you serve? Fungicide on corn is huge. So we're looking at the Midwest here. Fungicide on corn is a growing uh, application, uh, growing in demand. That's for a couple of reasons. Um, you've got more disease pressure uh, than there used to be. Um, new diseases uh, coming from kind of the north moving south and even south moving north in some cases. And then you have fungicides that are getting better. Um, so fungicides, is, fungicides are the only uh, class of chemical where you have new um, uh, active ingredients uh, over the past decade uh, on a fairly large scale. And so fungicides are getting better and better every year. Uh, meaning that more and more farmers want to use them because the ROI is higher every year. And the reason corn makes a lot of sense because obviously when corn is 10 feet tall, it's hard to get a ground rig over it. And so air application is very common on corn for fungicide. Um, so this is a great place to start, fungicide on corn. And then we talk about, uh, okay, what do you charge for this type of application? Um, we'll get into more of this later, but kind of our recommendation baseline really is about $2 more than a helicopter application in your area because it is, again, area specific. And we'll talk about these prices a bit later. Um, and then if you're, obviously drones can do more than just whole field application. And so if we're looking at some of those niche applications, you know, smaller fields, if you have to do a lot of, you know, five acre fields or you do a lot of spot application, just targeted treatment um, across different parts of the field or, um, you know, niche applications, then really, possibly an hourly or per job rate might make more sense. Um, and Trey will talk about this a bit more later as well. Again, do not compete with ground rigs on herbicide. Now herbicide works great out of a drone. Um, we've seen this time and time again, but competing with ground rigs is not a good idea because frankly, in, in many cases, they can do it better as far as more even coverage. Um, and they can reduce drift because you know they're not applying from the air. So if you're doing herbicide with a drone, you really need to think about why you're doing herbicide. You're doing it because a ground rig can't do it. So you're doing spot application. The spot application of herbicide is, is a tremendous um, a value uh, for farmers because how else would they, if they have a bunch of little pockets, you know, one acre um, spots across a hundred acre field, how are they going to control that? A drone works great at doing that, those kind of jobs. Um, and then you think about 
what other jobs can a ground rig not do? Wet fields, uh, wet fields, obviously. Tires can't go through wet fields very well. So a drone works uh, works tremendous there. And you have an advantage really over other types of air application crop dusters um, in for, for herbicide as well. When you think about an airplane going at 120 miles an hour dropping out herbicide, you know the risk of, of drift is, is substantial there versus a drone, you can control drift uh, much better. And then lastly here, when we think about row crop, um, last type application that you know, we see a lot of value in and really kind of being under, um, underutilized right now, I think is overseeding of cover crop. Cover crop is uh, seeding is going to be growing over the next uh, several years because of carbon credits uh, and other things as well. And so more and more farmers are gonna want cover crop seeded and different types of cover crop seeded. And the only way to apply some cover crops is to overseed. And there's not a lot of supply here. You know, most, most aerial applicators don't, don't do granular, granular work during cover crop overseeding timeframe there in the fall uh, or late summer. And so drones offer a, a great solution to this problem. All right, so here's just, you know, when you think about, you know, creating a drone business, starting a drone business, you know, we just talked about three kind of types of applications, really one main one, fungicide on corn. Of course, you have other crops too. You got wheat, you got soybeans, um, and maybe if you're in an area that's more, more diverse in the Midwest, uh, you have a lot of other choices there as far as crops go. But what you want to think about is, you know, outside the box type applications. So using this, this spreader system uh, to its, its full advantage, you know, think about spot spreading fertilizer. We've done a lot of that here over the past year. Um, and that is a tremendous value. Again, specialty crops, something that we are working very hard on uh, to provide uh, some data as far as, you know, how these drones um, actually work in different types of specialty crops, and then some use cases and some uh, parameters um, as for that as well. The painted greenhouses, uh, pasture management, I think is also very underutilized. When we talk about pasture management, it's a lot of herbicide. And I said, don't use drones for herbicide on a wide scale in, in row crop. And that's a lot of it has to do with the labeling, but pasture herbicides are less restrictive when it comes to aerial application. And nobody likes driving over a pasture. And so if you can fly over a pasture, then it makes a lot more sense. And so there could be a lot of value there if you're in an area that has pasture and row crop as well, then you could provide services for both of those industries. Um, and then of course, wetland management, this, this uh, probably will pertain to a lot of you guys too in the Midwest, where you have irrigation lakes um, or you know, ponds that uh, need to be managed for, for weed or algae, then wetland management is, is a tremendous uh, asset. Okay, so now that we've kind of covered um, you know, some of the, the more pressing questions on what markets you might be looking at, what type of applications. At some point, you probably ought to think about, um, you know, the licensing aspect here. So what do you need before you can legally start flying uh, with the drone and spraying with the drone? And so this is just a list here. It's two pages here. Um, this is some of the FAA stuff first, 107, 137, 4807, class two medical and in number are what you need for uh, the FAA portion of your licensing. Now we help you get through the vast majority of this. We provide you resources for your 107. We give you links to your class two medical. We give you links to your, how to do your in number. And we provide you with, uh, we actually have a regulations consultant who does the 137 and 44807 uh, partially on your behalf. So she'll help you get started with all the paperwork because it's a lot of paperwork. Um, and then she helps you get started or do the second half of that yourself. We won't go into a lot of detail on this because this can take uh, about an hour to kind of talk about. Um, but just know that we help you get through this process, the, the licensing process um, from start to finish. Now, what you also have to know is some of this takes time. So the one, 107, the class two medical, and the in number registration, that is relatively uh, simple and quick. You can get all of those done in a matter of about three weeks or four weeks. Now the 137 and 44807, those are not ne necessarily licenses, they're actually exemptions, meaning you have to petition for the exemption, meaning that the FAA has to approve you for this. And it takes time, it's a, it's a waiting game is what it is really. 
Um, and you're looking at really about, I mean, you know, nobody really knows because it's different for everybody, um, every case, because you're working with the FAA, you're working one-on-one -on -one with them. And so you're looking at really, we think about a year um, from when if you start this process to when you get your 137. And some of you are sitting here thinking, okay, well, this is, I mean, ruins my plans for next year. If it takes a year to do this entire process, uh, then I might as well look at this for next year. Well, we have uh, kind of a workaround here. So the 137 and the 44807, those are entity level exemptions, meaning that whenever you apply for yours, our recommendation is that you start an LLC, start a, a incorporate a company. So instead of applying for these, uh, these exemptions under um, you know, Joe Smith, apply for them under Joe's Custom Application Services LLC. That way, anybody that works um, under, you know, for your for your business as an applicator or a pilot um, or employee can utilize these exemptions. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, if these are entity level exemptions, then I can probably just operate under somebody else's exemption as an employee or an operator for them. And the answer is yes, you can. Um, so as long as uh, you are operating for an entity who has these exemptions and they're doing doing the billing then yes, uh, you can operate under their licenses, under their exemptions. Now, we don't offer this service ourselves through AgriSpray Drones. We want to uh, help you guys get your own, but we have partnered with a, a nonprofit called the Walkway Foundation. They're an ag nonprofit. They have a, uh, a division called Pharmatude or a program called Pharmatude in which they try to help uh, the youth in America get involved in agriculture through technology. And part of this technology is drones. And so they have a 137, they have a 44807, and we partner with them to help them raise money uh, for their organization. And in turn, they've allowed our customers to operate under their 137 and 44807 uh, for a small fee. And there's no strings attached. So you operate under, under them as, as an applicator for Pharmatude until you get your own 137, and then you can hop off and, um, and operate under your own 137. So... Uh, ask us if you want more information about that, just please ask us about that. That is a Pharmatude program. And then of course, um, after your, your FAA stuff is done, you'll also need to do your state um, licensing. So state pesticide applicators licensing. Now this, this is different from state to state. So just uh, contact your state pesticide department uh, and ask them what, what they need uh, from you, what licenses that you need to uh, do aerial application in that state. Then, of course, applicator insurance as well. And Vaughn Tolbert, he's kind of our recommendation uh, for applicator insurance. Okay, so let's look at equipment that you might need uh, to, um, to run a, a custom application business. And we'll look at drone equipment, we'll look at uh, field operations setup, and then we'll talk a bit about overhead maintenance, service life, resale value, the million dollar question everybody always asks. Uh, we'll try to answer that a little bit as well, too. So which model is right for you? Well, it just depends what you're doing. Um, vast majority of our customers buy the biggest drone that they can get. So they can get over more acres uh, per hour, more acres per day. Um, but there are some niche applications that do require a much more portable drone. You know, the T10 is a very portable drone. It's only 10 liters. Um, so each of these models, so T10, 10 liters, T30, 30 liters, T40, 40 liters. That's two and a half, eight, and 10 and a half gallon. But the T-10 is a very portable drone. Um, so if you're looking at test plots or spot applications, uh, this may be a great fit for you. Um, and then if you look at whole field applications, the T-30 and the T-40 um, are probably going to be uh, more so up your alley. The, you know, we can talk a, a lot about which one is, is better, um, but not necessarily right here because I want to give time uh, to our, our other folks on the call too. Um, so this is just kind of a... Uh, an example of what that package is going to look like, um, the package that you get from us anyways, the drone equipment package. And if you want more details on this, then yeah, just uh, give us a, a, a shout, shoot us an email, and we can give you kind of a breakdown of what each of these items um, uh, mean. But this is what you're looking at essentially here on the, for the drone. Now, something that's perhaps more important for you to think about is your field operations setup. What kind of truck and trailer setup do you need for your type of, of application? Now, we can't tell you what is perfect for you because every application is different. Are you traveling 50 miles between locations to do services or are you traveling five? 
are your fields 100 acres a piece or are they you know acre you know acre irrigation lakes um you know what what is right for you may not be right for somebody else but things might be able to, might want to think about it are um you know where are you gonna put your generator because you have to have a generator uh you know storage on for fuel running cords um plumbing is huge so you know what it boils down to is how do you set up for efficiency you know move from one location to the next quickly and swap batteries and fill tanks on the drone quickly as well and of course plan for op operator comfort because there is no ac cab on these drones you have to make your own now here's just a quick overview of kind of what the roi looks like on you know for one drone starting a one drone um, uh, service so if you want to buy a drone buy a truck buy a trailer get started from scratch is what you're looking at and when you break it down on a three-year note you're looking at about thirty-seven thousand dollars a year uh, for the equipment annual expenses might run up to about ten thousand dollars a year so you're looking at roughly fifty thousand dollars a year in total expenses um, and these are conservative numbers so this this could be less uh, for sure and then we look at the revenue side you know, we found that most of our operators across the Midwest, at least when we're looking at fungicide on corn, we have to keep it specific here, fungicide on corn, we're looking at a two gallon rate, about $15 per acre is what they were charging, some more, some less, it just depends where you're at. And so when you break that down, take your expenses out of it, you're looking at about $10 per acre net. And then if you just break that down to ROI, you're looking at, uh, if you let's just say 60 days of operation. You know, if we look at the summer, we have about 60 days that you could operate and a T40, you're looking at, uh, let's say about 30 acres per hour. That's fairly conservative, 250 acres per day. So about $100,000 of net income at a 60 days of operation. And of course, you know, this ranges wildly depending on what you are actually doing. So uh, I would like to open it up now um, to our guest speakers. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Trey. All right. We'll start off with uh, Trey Neal. Uh, he's from Monroe City, uh, just north of us, actually. And he just started a custom application business um, this past spring. So, Trey, I will let you take the floor. Okay. Hi, I'm Trey Neal, uh, owner of Prairie Queen Agrodome Solutions in Monroe City, Missouri. Uh, we started a spray drone business essentially from scratch uh, in about March of last year. So uh, we started, uh, we decided we needed a, a way to expand our existing seed business. And this seemed like a pretty good fit uh, timeline wise. You know, we didn't have a whole lot going on with the seed business in summer. Yeah, we're kind of finishing up some beans and stuff like that. But as far as you know, late June, July, and August, um, we, we had an opportunity and had had the time and the manpower to to expand and and try to generate some revenue and bring some more value to our customers. So uh, that's kind of what we what we started on. Um, I guess a little bit of my background prior to prior to this, I worked for a machinery dealership. Uh, did various things at, at the dealership level. Uh, worked for a co-op prior to that. So I've been around fungicide and spraying application stuff for, for several years. Um, so that's kind of, I had some background knowledge in spraying, I guess I was what I'm trying to say. Um, business structure. So our business, we have an existing business with a seed business. So it has its own LLC. This, the spray business is a separate LLC and there's multiple reasons for that. One, so the one business can protect from the other one, essentially, and it separates everything out. And like Taylor was saying, too, uh, with us hiring a, a pilot that's going to uh, fly for us this coming year, he will actually operate underneath R-137. Uh, is that all I could think about on business structure-wise? Is that kind of what she was after? I think that makes sense, yeah. <laughs> um, our main target is uh, corn and soybean, uh, wheat. Wheat fungicide is something I keep kicking myself about last year, just because it usually falls around Mother's Day. We're usually still busy trying to get beans out the door. We gave up a big opportunity on wheat acres this past year, and I don't anticipate doing that again. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for wheat because in our area, the helicopters and airplanes don't necessarily come in for wheat. Wheat is not, 
there's not thousands of acres of wheat in our area. There's pockets of three, 400 acres. Well, that's perfect for a drone. You give a drone a couple of days, it's done. Uh, so th those are kind of our targets is corn, soybean, wheat customers. Um, Primarily fungicide, I assume. Fungicide, yep, yep. And actually insecticide a lot of the times too. A lot of insecticide went on this past year. What kind of uh, uh, like special or niche applications did you do? Oh, uh, irrigation lakes. So we sprayed irrigation lakes to kill lily pads that were plugging up the pumps. Um, went sprayed uh, duck ponds for duck hunters uh, to clean them up. Um, uh, spot sprayed a lot of shatter cane. We had a lot of shatter cane breaking late this summer. Guys had perfect looking bean fields. Just a few sprigs of shatter cane here and there. We go out and spot spray those. Uh, that's about all the specialty ones I can think of. So how do you, uh, I guess, first off, what do you charge uh, per acre for like your whole field application um, for fungicide, let's say? And then how does that differ for some of these spot application services you offer? Okay, so... When, uh, when I'm doing fungicide acres, if you're buying the chemical from us as well, um, our application rate figures out to be between 16 and 16.50 an acre for application. That's if you're buying the product from us. Uh, so obviously we're buying, buying the product at wholesale price and we're, we're selling it retail. So we're making, depending on the product, between two and six dollars an acre on the product it's, uh, as well. So if I'm if I'm flying your product, so I've, I did some custom flying for uh, local retailers in town, we ended up being at $18 an acre. Um, it sounds really high, but when they can't get a plane to come in and do the job and the farmer wants the job done, that sounds bad to say, but they don't have any other option. And to be quite honest, at that point, you got you to charge enough to make it worth your time to do it. And if you're going to go out and spray 20 acres, you need to bring in some money to go do it because... It takes time to get in the truck, get everything loaded up, go to the field, do the job. Doing the job is the quickest part of all of it. It's all the other time that it's, it's what takes time. What did you find as far as, you know, that's that's probably higher than what the airplanes and helicopters were charging in your area? Yeah, I'm two, two to four dollars an acre higher than a yeah. helicopter airplane. Did you find that hampered your demand at all? Nope, no. not at all. No, never run out of work. Yeah. I turned down more acres than I care to admit. Yeah. What about uh, these spot applications that you were doing? Um, what do you charge for that? Uh, so I charge an hourly on the spot application. Uh, 300 is what I did on, on some shatter cane, $300 an hour. Uh, it was close to home. Uh, it didn't take long to do it. Um, the one irrigation lake that I did, I actually charged by the acre, uh, but it was a pretty high load of, of aquatic glyphosate. Uh, probably an hour away from home, we were, we were, I want to say 50, $60 an acre is what we ended up charging on that. And $25 of that was product alone, my cost on product. So I had a lot of money wrapped up in it, but we charged accordingly to make a little bit, but some other spot spraying we've done um, right at $400 an hour. Mm -hmm. So that's flight hours. Yeah. Flight time. So, right. And then on your billing, um, do you bill, based off of the acre, like the acreage map that they give you, the farmer gives you, or do you bill based off the coverage map that the drone has? So I, I bill off of kind of a number between that. Yeah. So if I fly a field, a, a, a farmer says it's a 40 acre field and I map it and fly it, you know, you, you got to stay off of the trees, out of the trees and all that. It may say that I flew 37 acres. Um, farmer says it was 40. I say I flew 37. I'm probably going to build a farmer 38 to 39 acres mm -hmm. that covers me for the areas that it did actually did actually slide out from the prompts. That's not showing necessarily on my coverage map, uh, but it's, it's, it's a fair, it's a fair acreage for everybody mm -hmm. that way. Makes sense. Um, any feedback from your customers who had their products flown on the first time by a drone? Uh, the older the customer, the more amazed they were about it. <laughs> uh, the, the older, the 60 to 70 year old guys, uh, I can't tell you how many of them sit on the back of the trailer and just visit all day long and just were amazed by it. Yeah. We didn't get the acres covered per hour that I wanted to then, but you learn quite a bit from the old guys too, sitting there visiting with them all day long. Uh, 
but yeah, it, everybody's been been amazed by it. Every, it. Nobody's seen it. It's not common practice. Everybody's seen the helicopters and the airplanes by now, but to see somebody sitting along the road flying something in and out, that's that's something new. That's something different. There's not too many vehicles that don't stop and ask what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's good for parties. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Uh, <clears throat> any any other key takeaways you want to leave with these guys? Don't undervalue yourself. Uh, I know there are some people doing it quite a bit cheaper. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying you got to go out and make a killing and and make a living off everybody else, but uh, your time is valuable. Your equipment's valuable. You're the one with the license. You're the one with the insurance. You're the one with the vehicle. You're the one with all the expense. Charge accordingly for it, mm -hmm. and stay organized. Get a good invoicing system. Keep track of. You got to have log records, anyways, for part of your licensing. Any anyhow, so you'll have that. But just stay organized and keep keep customers in line and communicate. People want to know. Yeah, you might think you're going to be there in a week. It's maybe ten days. Just communicate with them. Mm -hmm. Call. Start calling once it gets dark. Let people know where you're at. Most people don't get too discouraged at all. As long as they know you're you're still on the list and you're coming, they'll find. Good advice. So. Anything else got. you got for us? Well, we could talk all day. Yeah. <laughs> no. what, yeah, Trey and I were talking earlier, and it, it, this could be a six-hour presentation. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Trey. Sure appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to uh, swap right over to Zoe. Zoe, are you on with us right now? Yes, I am. Great. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Hi, Zoe. Um, so, yeah, uh, Zoe's with Helicrops um, down in uh, Illinois. And uh, she ran a, a big team this year, actually, and uh, they had to jump over a lot of hurdles, face a lot of challenges, and uh, they got a lot of work done. So I'm going to turn it over to Zoe, and she's going to tell you about her experience. Okay, well, thank you, Taylor. Um, first off, it's been a pleasure working with you. So thank you for all your help this summer. I called you more times than I like to admit. But um, so yes, as Taylor said, I am Zoe Markman. I am the drone operations coordinator for Helicrops LLC out of Flora. Uh, my uh, business is owned by Chad Egan, Paul Trainer, and a few other guys, but pretty much Helicrops is made up of a couple different companies. So we've got like chemical companies and seed companies and everybody just kind of came together and said, we need aerial application in our area. And I think it started uh, by eight to nine years ago now. So that's kind of what our business structure is. And so we are, we have mostly helicopters now and that's how they sprayed prior to owning drones. And so this summer we operated four T-30s and we had teams of three people. So we had two pilots and one loader and so our pilots would be in charge of mapping the fields and executing the tasks while our loader was in charge of making sure our trailer and our truck was um, equipped with everything that we needed running and beforehand too. So in the morning and every night, um, they were really there to support our, uh, our crew, so our, our pilot operators. Um, so kind of how I got into this is I've been chasing in my dream of being a crop duster myself and um, I went to school at Murray State and got a degree in agricultural science with an emphasis in emerging technology which just so happens to be drones so I helped Murray State build their drone program and that's kind of what gave me a foot in here um, I think agriculture is something that we overlook or not maybe us on this podcast or on this web webinar but um, just in general uh, society does overlook agriculture and how important it is to our world, it feeds us obviously. So that's kind of where my passion lies and, and how I kind of got started into this. Um, going back to kind of how our businesses ran. So like I said, we had teams, two teams with three people on each team and we would run daylight to dusk. I mean, it was, it was long days. Taylor can account for that too. His guys were doing the same thing. So we would apply fungicide on corn and we did wheat season as well, but we did corn run and then obviously some beans too. So we just straight row crops. Um, we also charge somewhere between the 13 to $18 uh, per the acre. And so we um, charge the same for the helicopters because we are, we're working hand in hand with them. So we were not trying to compete or do anything more than what the helicopters are doing because what if we could keep somebody um, out of the seat in a field that was you know had power lines and had tree lines that were kind of gnarly we would we would much rather put our drone team out there and um, get them to be able to, to to do that field for us rather than try to you know put one of our helicopters in there so I think um, 
there's a place kind of Taylor kind of touched on this. I think there's a place for helicopters and planes. I think there's a place for drones as well. And we really saw that this summer where it was a lot easier for a drone to get in there that get in somewhere that did have some, you know, a tree canopy that was pretty gnarly or some power lines that crossed over or even just, you know, trees and obstacles that are already in the field as well. Um, Taylor, is there anything that you wanted me to touch specifically on? Well, I like that there. Um, you know, a lot of people think that, well, gosh, I can't compete with a helicopter because, or an airplane because they're covering so many more acres per day. Um, so I guess maybe elaborate a bit more about um, kind of, you know, how you decided where to send the helicopters and how you decided where to send the the, the drones and um, what what types of fields, um, I guess maybe, maybe the breakdown of fields in your area, you know? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, yeah, so, um... We're obviously Southern Illinois, Midwest. It's uh, mostly flat, but there are some hills when we get down into Kentucky and over into the Missouri area. So um, we kind of being in the business that we're in and that it's been, we, we've been doing it for a uh, many, many years. Um, the helicopter pilots kind of knew which fields they knew they could get into and some fields that they knew that they really didn't want to mess with. Um, even our new customers too, we would kind of, you know, get the map and be like, all right, this has, you know, all, it's got one little bitty opening and three sides that are completely, you know, the tree lines are overgrown real bad and or there's power lines crossing in. So it would depend on the acreage too, I think. Um, you know, we're not gonna send a helicopter 200 miles north to do a 20 acre field. We're gonna send us, we're gonna load up and go do it too. So I think it was just kind of um, comparing, you know, acreage, what the cost of it was gonna be for us to get over there and obviously, you know, how safe it was. Was it safer to send the drone team or is it safer to send a helicopter? The helicopters were much more efficient on doing flat open fields. Um, the drones can do it, but it, I mean, they're meant to, to get into the tight confined spaces. And so that's, that's what we used them for. We did it to support the helicopters. And um, I think it turned out really well. I think we covered about 6,100 acres this summer. Um, that's starting in fungicide season and working all the way through cover crop too. So I think we had some higher expectations of what we were going to achieve, but we also learned a lot along the way. Of, I think we pushed the the uh, capabilities of the drone pretty hard. <laughs> and that, that's one thing I'll say too, and I think you brought up a good point there. I mean, use the drones to do some of these more challenging fields, mm -hmm. these fields that uh, may be smaller or that were further distance away um, or that had trees and power lines. And so when it comes to efficiency, those fields, you won't get the efficiency out of that you'll get out of a, you know, a large square open field. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like with the helicopters and we've said it, there's a time and a place for each, but the drones are a lot easier and a lot um, better to, to really apply. They get to go, you know, you can send them into the corners where the trees do overlap some. Um, they, you know, they're flying anywhere from 10 foot above the crop to 15, just depending on kind of what you're, what you're applying, but they're able to really apply apply I feel like maybe even better um, in some of those fields where the crop duster or like the plane or the helicopter has to dust over the field the, the drones really really applying that um, fungicide down and uh, so I think that's kind of where there's a perk as well. I don't know if you can, if you want to keep going. I think that we lost Taylor. I'll say too, kind of maybe if we're still going just to kind of help them while they're trying to get things sorted out. Um, I think that one of our biggest challenges was that um, we didn't educate our crew um, on not only agriculture, but also just 
on um, just on the drones as well. I think that there was a little bit that we kind of expected our people to know. And um, so uh, Taylor offers some training classes and things like that. And I think we're going to be definitely more, um, more, we're going to push our, our, our employees to come and to, to learn a little bit more about what they're doing and why they're doing it, especially, and, and with the drones and how to operate them as well. So I was just talking over some challenges that we had. Thanks. We've had some challenges ourselves here. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Zoe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, anything else? Oh, I guess one question I did have, um, you know, since you guys are a bit unique um, operating both helicopters and drones, you know, there are some helicopter or I guess air application companies looking at this technology, um, adding it into uh, their, their business. Where I guess besides maybe the the smaller fields, are there anything else that drones have opened up possibilities for um, that helicopters weren't able to provide? Yeah, so uh, I think um, Trey kind of also touched on that the spot spraying and the different like specialty stuff. The helicopters don't do herbicide at all. Um, they do a lot of brush work though, and so this year we were able to kind of jump in on that and help them. Um, do the brushwork too. So we were able to fly some ditches. We also flew some waterways. The um, we had a customer call that had um, stripes of Johnson grass in their fields from the sprayer, then also getting clogged right behind the tires. And so we were actually able to help go out and do that, and it worked out perfect because the width of the the swath of the drone was perfectly lined up. So that was something a helicopter they needed a helicopter in there because the crop was the yield was very low and it was not um is not growing great anyway so they didn't want to run back over it with another sprayer so it worked out good for the drones to go out there we also did a little bit of shatter cane work and some water hemp too so we sprayed we did a lot of spot spraying that they have tried with the which the herbicide they didn't obviously run through a helicopter but there was some things that the helicopters usually do that we were able to help with this this uh summer and the cover crop too the cover crop was one thing that really we i think we probably did around 2000 acres of cover crop that usually the helicopter does but they didn't even have to get out and do this year so that was kind of cool too that's awesome yeah and i guess is there a reason that you use the drones for cover crop instead of the helicopters i think we wanted to see what the difference was and our our customers were the same way they were um they were kind of like, wow, this is kind of new and exciting. And if you, you know, have the time to do it, can you come do it? Which we asked the helicopters to help because we had way too much work. I kind of like Trey said, it's crazy that, you know, you think that you can't compete, but there's so much work out there that everyone, if we can all just do it together, there's, there's plenty of work to be done. But definitely we, I think the customers just wanted to see the drones work and how, how much more effective or if they were just as effective as the helicopters. You bet. That's great. Anything else you got, Zoe? Um, I don't think so. I appreciate it. Thank you. So yeah, well, that was great. A lot of good insight. Uh, thank you so much, Zoe. Look forward thank to you. working with you one more season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one question, uh, well, um, I'm downstairs now, everybody. I had to move from down, upstairs to downstairs and trade just got down here. Uh, did you talk about how many acres you covered uh, this past year? How many acres did you cover? Uh, one of the we covered 4,200 acres of spray and about 600 acres of cover crop. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys heard that, but uh, Trey had one T30 and they covered about four, uh, or he covered about 4,200 acres um, of mainly fungicide on the liquid application and then about 600 acres of cover crop application. Um, so that was with, with one machine. So you can make these things, make these things work a lot um, if you have the right uh, conditions, right situations for them for sure. Um, so we're going to go through just a couple more things here. I think Carrie is, is running my, uh, my presentation for me now. Um, so and then we'll answer questions. So if you guys are interested, if you haven't already, and you do want to learn more, um, you know, about, you know, how to get started and you want to quote, then just reach out to us, uh, shoot us an email, uh, give us a call, um, or go through our website. We'd be happy to, um, walk you through the process uh, a little bit more in detail. Uh, of course, uh, we do have uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, if you want more information, um, we're always posting stuff on there. 
uh, and coming out with some new videos um, so you can see firsthand what it's like to operate these drones. And here you go, this is our website, uh, phone and email right here. Of course, you can find all of this on our website um, as well. Okay, now I think we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. So if you have a question, um, you can go ahead and type it in on the uh, the chat and we'll kind of go through line by line. Uh, that's the best way to do it typically. All right, so I'm up here on Cole. Uh, Cole says, I live in an area with three Within 30 miles, we had just about 700 wind turbines. Northern Illinois, just checking. There is no problem with the drones flying under wind turbines. Blade tips are uh, 100 foot off the ground. Um, so yeah, I've never done this myself. Trey, have you done this? No. Okay, but we have talked with um, some folks who have operated around wind turbines and yeah, the blades aren't gonna, there, there's no problem uh, with that. Uh, just make sure your return to home altitude isn't set to 100 foot and you should be fine. Um, this may require a bit more manual flying, like on the return to home part. You know, if it's returning to home and there's wind turbine in, in you know, in the way, then you might want to just manually take over and fly it around. It's not a big deal at all. And then, of course, you do want to make sure you map out your obstacles uh, very well. And you can use uh, aerial imagery um, to do this in most cases. Um, so the mapping uh, becomes more crucial and possibly manual uh, manual operation during uh return to home flight could be crucial as well but yes you can it can absolutely uh fly in these areas and these areas are great when you look at niche applications or things that crop dusters uh can't really do wind turbines you know there's not very many crop dusters you're going to find they're going to want to operate around wind turbines and most time you they can't anyways um so great application for drones um how do you act at the corners? The spraying is not too efficient there. I use the border system. The drone goes around the field at the end. Yes, so um, this this so this is a, a, an operational question here. Um, how do you set your, your parameters up for the drone to apply evenly around the outside of the field, on the field edges and in the corners? And so again, what we have to, what we have to talk about here, guys, is uh, like I mentioned, is drones are aerial application. They're not ground application. If you want your field applied uh, as evenly, as thoroughly as possible, a ground machine is the way to do that. It has booms, it has uh, even application. Um, you can hang it out under trees and get into the corners. Um, you can do a very, very thorough job with a ground application machine. Um, now drones are the most effective aerial application, but they are still aerial application. So there may be spots where that'd be difficult to get if you have trees uh, in the field, um, overhanging branches, uh, things like that. But yes, uh, you can use that border system, like you said, uh, and mapping very thoroughly is how you do that. Uh, hey, Steve, uh, nice to see you on here. Questions for both panelists, except for FAA regulations, what are the biggest operation challenges for drone custom applicators? I think maybe Zoe um, hit on some of this, uh, biggest operating challenges besides the FAA, uh, Trey. Yeah. Oh, that's a look for it. <laughs> um, yeah, Tr Trey said all day out in the sun, which I can attest to that. Uh, get the worst part was that can't make it much easier than having uh, Katie or whatever. And then, uh, Kelly. Kelly. Kelly takes care of all that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're on Pharma too, right? Mm -hmm. All right. You're on. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah gotcha. Um, so, yeah. F FAA is tough, but uh, other than that, um, you have to be a hard worker. Um, you know, like, like both, you know, Zoe and Trey said, they were up the at the crack of dawn and didn't get done until after dusk um, and it's in the heat all day long. So that probably is one of the hardest parts. Okay, uh, Garrett says, how many acres would one T40 possibly spray in a season? Could one drone hit 15,000 acres in a year between all the different uses? Well, Garrett, this does depend on what type of applications you're gonna be doing um, and where you're at. You know, there are some areas we think about you know where Steve's from down in Alabama. Um, they have you can spray pretty much year round down there with all the different crops um, that they raise in the longer growing seasons and everything. And if you get even further into you know Florida and you know along the Gulf Coast or anywhere around around there, 
then yeah, you can spray all year long and 15,000 acres, depending on what type of application you're doing, probably wouldn't be difficult, um, honestly. Uh, but again, here in the Midwest, where we have really one growing season, um, you know, you've got, you know, one application on corn, one application on beans, one application on, on wheat. Uh, you can, you know, maybe double up in there um, on, on the same acre if you're looking at cover crop. So it would, might be a little difficult to hit that, um, not necessarily because the T40 couldn't do it, but because you don't have much time between the short application windows. I mean, really, we're looking at, you know, between probably about 60 days, 60 full days, you know, is what we kind of look at application in, in the summer um, for fungicide tack on a bit for wheat, you know, tack on a week or so for wheat, um, if you have wheat in your area, um, and then tack on some some time for cover crop as, as well. Um, and so the T40, maybe you're looking at realistically 10,000 acres, I know, I would say. Okay, uh, Kyle says, uh, what would you suggest for someone that wants to get into the business that may be uh, comfortable in the technology and aviation aspect, but might not have the agricultural experience or knowledge when it comes to knowing what specific chemical to spray uh, for the respective application. We have a lot of corn, cotton, rice, and sugar cane, as well as some opportunity for waterway vegetation control. It must be down south, Kyle. Um, so what I would suggest is um, kind of like we talked about partner partner with a retailer, um, partner with a co-op, you know, somebody that, that already offers, uh, already, already sells the chemical, you know, if you can partner with them, you know, most, a lot of the, a lot of pilots, a lot of um, ag pilots that are new, don't know a lot about uh, chemistry, about, about chemical, you know, about what to apply and where, you know, they're, they're pilots first and foremost. Um, and so they, they rely on these people, these retailers uh, to line everything up for them. Um, and to mix everything for them and they just fly and apply. And so you can absolutely do it. If you don't have ag experience, it's much better if you do have ag experience because you can go straight to the source then. Um, kind of like Trey said, they actually sell chemical themselves. Um, but if, if you don't have that knowledge, partner with the retailer who does have that knowledge and let them know that you're offering the service, let them know what you, what you can do and how much you charge um, and give them a cut to help you out. And that's the best way to do that. Um, have you done any pattern testing? We have done pattern testing, Robert. Um, on you know the the T40, we're kind of still waiting on on that pattern testing. It does at this preliminary time look better than the T30. The T30 pattern testing, it just depends on the nozzles, the height, the speed. Um, you know, when we're, when we're talking about aerial application, and if you guys are familiar with ground rigs, um, you know you've got an even application across your entire uh, length of of your your boom. Whereas aerial application, we're actually sending product out further than our booms and further than uh, our wingtips. Uh, we're relying on prop wash, relying on vortex. A vortex that's created um, from the wingtips or from the props in a drone's case. Um, and so speed and height, uh, and of course, uh, nozzle type of the T30 um, has, um, that has a lot to do with uh, pattern. Um, so you're not going to see that flat, you know, even application across that, you know, 27 foot, 30 foot swath or whatever you're doing. Um, you're going to see a bell shape, you know, so it's going to have more uh, application there in the center right underneath the drone. And it's going to get less and less and less as it goes away from the drone. Um, but you're going to get product out to further than what your application width is. So then what you rely on is you rely on that. Uh, that overlap to make up for what you don't have there in the in towards the middle of the application. We have we have this pattern testing available uh, to all of our customers on a resource folder. If you actually want to see what that looks like. Um, and then Steve, who was just uh, asked a question here, um, he's going to help us with pattern testing on the T40. Okay, uh, Jerry says in uh, pastures. I guess sorry to further answer your question there, Robert. Uh, T30, you're looking at really about 27 foot swath width, kind of max swath width. The T40 right now looks like about 32 foot max swath width, um, potentially is what we're seeing. Um, in pastures, do I have to mark the trees prior to applicating or will the drone detect all the obstacles uh, from Jerry? Um, well, so you never want to rely on the drone's obstacle avoidance um, 100%. You know, it's there as a backup, essentially. So yes, map and mark all the trees. You can do it very simply in the software. Um, it's not a difficult thing to do, um, and you, but you want to do that. Um, will it detect the trees? Most likely. 
Will it detect the trees and automatically go around them? Probably not. Um, they're, because the trees are a very big obstacle for it to detect and to go around. If you're flying at full speed, it'll detect it and it'll stop. So that's a lot of manual intervention there. Um, so mapping air obstacles is definitely the best way to do this. And we cover a lot of this in training too. Okay, Cade says, how do you handle multiple drones in the same field? I've heard mixed reviews on using this, this swarm feature. Do you use manually, do you just manually draw borders and cut the field in half? Okay, uh, so Cade, um, we, we recommend one drone per remote. Um, if you're running multiple drones in one field, use uh, a different drone for each remote, a uh, different remote for each drone. And there's a few reasons here. Um, because, you know, mainly because of redundancy and legality. Um, simply put, it's not, it's not legal to operate a large drones, you know, multiple large drones on one remote, with one operator. Um, so you have multiple remotes, well, there you go. Um, secondly, uh, re redundancy, if you have one remote and three drones connected to it, and I don't know, you forget to change the battery in that remote um, and it dies, or you kick it off the truck and it breaks, well, you got three drones up in the air, you're kind of screwed. Um, so you, you don't, the swarm feature isn't really a swarm feature. Um, and so using multiple remotes is no different. Honestly, it's better in my opinion. We can dive into this more later, um, but yeah, use multiple remotes. You just you mark out the boundary, uh, just make one boundary. And then there's a route segment feature. You just segment that route into multiple different segments. Uh, you save it, you upload it to the cloud, and you download it onto the other remotes. They you just assign each different segment to each different drone. This is the same way it works on one remote too, actually. Okay, uh, Niles says, what are the rules for flying two drones at once? Can one guy do that at all? Uh, legally speaking, no. Uh, one guy cannot, here in the US, uh, uh, fly one drone or two drones um, at once. Technically speaking, can you do it? Is it physically possible to do it? Uh, yes, depends what you're doing. Um, you know, keep in mind with one drone, you're refilling that tank and swapping that battery. You know, the drone's landing essentially uh, between every six and eight minutes. And so with two drones, that's between every three and four minutes, you have a drone on the ground. And it takes about a minute or so uh, for you to do that battery swap and everything. Um, so two drones for one guy is possible, technically speaking, but I'll keep you hustling. Um, all right, uh, we've got a question here. One more, how do you avoid drifting? Okay, how do you avoid drift? Um, if we're looking at, you know, this is a, one big reason that the you know, fungicide makes a lot of sense with aerial application uh, because you don't have to worry about drift as much. If you drift fungicide on a neighbor's crop, well, they're going to be happy about it. You know, they get free fungicide. You have herbicide on their crop and that might not be a good thing. Um, so herbicide is what you're looking at here. And again, this is one more reason why I say herbicide shouldn't be your primary use application um, for custom work, especially. Uh, but you can use with the T30, you can use bigger nozzles. So AIXR nozzles um, to get larger larger droplets. Um, you can use, um, uh, there's some drift reducing, uh, some DRAs or drift reducing agents uh, that you can use, some surfactants you can use. Um, and more to come on this, on which ones work best um, with the T40, because the T40's nozzles are different. Um, but you can use larger droplets with the T40. So staying lower, uh, flying slower, uh, using a drift uh, reducing um, adjuvant is, is how you do this. And, or just honestly, keep a buffer too. Um, okay, when starting up, what are some things needed in a setup that might not be typically thought of needing or wanting? Uh, what are some things you added kind of mid season, Trey? Fuel shells in the trailer for batteries and burgers. One thing that I think was overshot was uh, the amount of money they spent on plumbing and things. <laughs> yeah. It takes take a lot of, well, to kind of how you want to do it, but as yeah, yeah. So, I don't know if you guys heard that, but uh, uh, have a good plumbing setup and spend money on that. Um, it was a, was a big thing. Um, and I and storage shelves, he said, for batteries. I think that the convenience aspect really is is kind of what that all boils down to. I had switches to like her pumps on and off from outside the trailer. Yeah. So, it didn't trigger in time. That yeah. was a big one. Yeah, switches for pumps. Yeah. So, really, you know, a lot of things revolve around. You know, think about this, like we just said, you're refilling that tank every six to eight minutes. 
um, on this drone. And if they had multiple drones, that's every three to four minutes. And so that's trips back and forth all day long with the trailer. So if you can make that simple, where it's flip a switch, grab a hose, grab a battery, then you're done. Well, that's much better uh, than having to plug something in, all that kind of stuff. Uh, can you spray chemicals and organic fertilizers with the same drone? Uh, okay, gotcha here. Well, uh, I assume you don't want to cross contaminate. That's what you mean by this question here. Um, so this kind of just depends on you know what you're doing. If you're, for me, if if I was providing services to organic farmers, I probably would not put any chemical through that drone uh, because you might be found liable if it shows up. I know on a random check that they have on uh, from the USDA. Um, now, could you? Yes, you could. Um, but if you're worried about cross contamination, you can uh, you can change out tanks. You can get a separate tank. But of course, you do have lines that are difficult to change. Um, you know, from one chemical to the next, uh, and nozzles you can change those too. But you just wanted to it just depends on liability here, in in my opinion. Okay, what would be the best way to develop new customers and build relationships just starting out? Um, so again, uh, Caitlin here, um, the, it depends, you know, like, like Trey, um, Trey already had you know, a lot of seed customers that, that they worked with. Um, same thing with us, you know, when we started doing custom application, we had, we had seed customers. I was a pioneer dealer. Um, so we had, we had seed customers. And so we already had that list. Um, so for you, if you don't know any farmers in your area, I, the question is, how do you find those farmers, uh, do it. Co-ops, co yeah. Just like we talked about earlier, co-ops and retailers, uh, those places that already sell chemical and sell seed, uh, ask them for help. And chances are you can, you can work out a partnership with them, actually, and they'll provide you with, with the business. Yeah, Kyle, yeah, Louisiana. I, I thought you may have been down there somewhere. Um, okay, so David says, do you use the T30 or... T40 to fly the field to see where to spot spray. Uh, so mapping. Uh, depends, David. So yes, both of these drones do have um, uh, FPV cameras, so you can see what they see. And so if your your fewer weeds are you know are big, if you've got big patches of weeds, you know, like I'm thinking about terrace channels. If you have terrace channels that are drowned out and have grown up in, in weeds, then you can absolutely, um, in real time, fly the drone, look at the camera, see those weeds, fly down to it, and then spray it right there at the same time without actually mapping at all. Um, now, if you've got a lot of weeds out there, you probably, you can't actually make uh, process stitched imagery. Or you can't you can't actually take in pictures with these drones and stitch the imagery together um, on like a laptop, let's say, and for like high resolution field imagery. The T40 does have this capability to actually it does have a 12 megapixel camera on it. You can um, you know fly over and it'll take pictures and it'll stitch the imagery together, but it won't really identify where to where your spots uh, are for spot spraying. Um, so that's where a second drone like a um, the new, there's a Mavic 3 multispectral coming out very soon. That's going to be the industry standard uh, for RGB or regular Im imagery and, um, and uh, multispectral imagery. And that can be used for spot spraying, yes. Uh, more to come on that soon. Okay, Philip says, I've seen your launch box before. Uh, you can't find it on your website. Can you talk about your launch box and how it works and what it costs? Uh, you can't find it on our website, Philip, because we quit making the launch box um, very, you know, somewhat shortly after we started making it. Launch box was uh, an idea for the, the T20. It was a concept for transportability uh, for the Agris T20. Uh, the T20 was only offered for uh, for our first year, really, and then the T30 came out and everybody wanted the T30, and the launch box wasn't a great concept for the T30 only for the T40 for transportability purposes. Um, so we don't actually offer the launch box. Now, part of the launch box was the auto mixing feature. Um, we are looking about looking at bringing this forward as a commercial product um, to autonomously mix chemical throughout the day um, without having to mix everything up ahead of time and be able to change rates easily. Um, so more to come on that, but unfortunately our launch box is not available for anything else. But the T20, we do have, I think, maybe a couple units left if you have a T20.
Okay, Laura says, for the first panelist, when did you decide to start the drone side of your business and how long before you were able to uh, start last spring? In other words, how did you go through the part 137 process uh, through agri spray slash pharmatude? Yeah. 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 So that's what Trey said. Yeah. Once you get him a pharmatude, uh, he worked pharmatude program um, this past year. So that process there, once you start, I mean, once you provide all your information to them, you know, your, your 107 license, your pesticide license, your insurance, and then uh, you get tested, it takes about an hour or so to, to get tested. You're good to go. Two, three weeks, you can have all that done. Yeah. Like Trey said, two or three weeks and you can have all that, all that done through the pharmatude program. Yeah, getting your own 137 takes a bit longer, but Pharma 2 uh, is relatively quickly. Um, I, I think that that answered that question there. All right, Dave said, I already have a quote and have visited for a demo. Would it be best to purchase the drone, have it delivered and familiarize with it before your class or wait until after? Do you have a date for the class in January? Okay, Gabe. Um, yeah, you know, it, this this is a personal preference, I guess. You know, I think really what we've seen is the way we do our trainings now, it does make sense to have a little bit of experience ahead of time. Um, so at least know, okay, this is how um, the remote is set up. This is, you know, what the sticks do. This is how you take off. This is how you map, you know. And then what we do is go through some really detailed stuff. Um, and so having a drone, is not a bad idea and having a little bit of time to familiarize yourself with it. Um, we do have some, a class in January. I don't have the date on that. Um, we have to contact um, uh, uh, Troy Ann or Misty at the office and they, they can get you that, that date. Okay, next question. Uh, do you have a loaner or backup inventory if your drone malfunctions during peak season? Um, so, Yes, sort of. Um, we it, it depends what's going on. Yeah, we have done this. Absolutely. Um, we have had situations where drones, you know, out of the box, you know, they've got problem after problem after problem. And it's nothing that the operator is doing. It's just something that the drones just malfunctioning. And so, yeah, we just swap drones out. We take that defective one back. We send you a brand new one. Um, you know, a lot of times, as long as the drone works throughout the, uh, you know, the first few weeks, you know, and it's up and running, it's flying, everything's working fine. Um, if it, if something malfunctions, it's typically something very minor. Um, like, yeah, you might have, uh, you know, an ESC go out, uh, well, as long as it's not in the air when that happens, you should replace the ESC. Um, you know, even if you crash it, honestly, you crash it, you can have it up running the next day. Uh, these things are very easy to fix. Same day. Same day. Trey says, same day. <laughs> uh, so fixing them is very easy. So a lot of times it's actually, depending on where you're at, of course, uh, better just for us to get you the parts uh, or for you to visit, visit one of our, our techs and get it fixed. Yeah. Um, if you could talk about the longevity of the DJI products, what are maintenance costs slash flight hours? Flight hour. Uh, so, okay, how long are they going to fly? Well, Robert, um, we don't really have a great um, idea or, or a great number on this. You know, DJI says batteries, you know, the uh, thousand charge cycles, essentially, is what they say on a battery. Now, we have seen some go past this a little bit, um, and they're still working fine. Uh, motors, we don't necessarily know. Um, you know, we haven't actually replaced, we've replaced very few motors that weren't involved in a crash you know so if somebody had a motor problem typically is because it's all involved in a crash and it suffered damage um and other than that you've got escs escs do go out eventually um you know you're looking at between we've seen them go out as early as well the t30 was kind of dependent on the, on the t30 um but you know as long as you haven't had a good esc you're looking at 300 to 600 hours look like from what we saw um you know pumps of course you've got some maintenance on pumps um on the t30 the t40 pumps are a bit less maintenance you know really maintenance costs are very very limited um if you spread cover crop you might chip your props a little bit um so you might want to get a new set of props after that but other than that maintenance costs are very very limited um so when we look at operating costs 
on these drones, it depends what you're doing, but if you're looking at, let's say, two gallon rate uh, fungicide, um, you're looking at really about a dollar an acre. That would inc incorporate the, the battery replacement cost. So replacing the batteries after they eventually crap out on you. Um, and it would also incorporate you know, fuel in the generator, fuel in your pickup to get there, and what minor maintenance costs you have. Now, if you crash it, well, that's more maintenance costs, obviously, but that's something different than maintenance costs. And hours of flight, how long will they fly? I mean, again, they are, they are modular. So if one component does, does bite the dust on you, uh, that one component is replaceable. And the frame will last, frankly, a lifetime. Uh, okay, Niles says, how long does it take to get a licensing flight pesticide air applicators? Have you seen these drones work for any other tasks other than spraying like random winter work or something so first off licensing so most of these licenses uh even like your pesticide applicators license your your uh your 107 um those can be done within a matter of two three weeks um you have to study obviously um but once you study um pass your tests those are done 137 for 407 like we said earlier those are exemptions not necessarily the licenses but exemptions those can take a while they can take up to a year um you know, FAA's hopefully getting faster on this, uh, but right now it looks like about uh, between six months to a year is kind of what, what we're seeing. Um, and then have you seen the drones work for winter work? Um, yeah, so like we said, there are there are a ton of applications you can do with these drones. Um, that is part of our job right now. We've devoted some, uh, some, some people uh, to, um, uh, figuring out what applications can be done, what market exists, because if it's an application that only works for one person, well, it's not very useful. Uh, but if it's an application that works for a wide variety of people, um, then we want to figure that out. That way we can get you guys the information. That way you can, um, you know, open up your, your services. Um, so the list is a bit too long to go through right now. Um, but winter work, uh, we have had some people spread, um, spread salt. Now, Again, these are lithium ion batteries, so they don't work that well uh, too far below freezing. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, is there a software that will produce a deliverable for the customer? What I mean by this is a picture similar to the map on the controller with the area covered and rate applied, et cetera. Okay, Dan, yes, um, there is software. Um, and Trey, you're gonna pull up your, uh, yeah. No yeah. Uh, Trey, Trey's pulling up his smart farm app. So DJI has uh, two applications, essentially. They have an app on, on your phone. So iOS or Android uh, called smart farm. And uh, smart farm is um, uh, basically, it, it hooks up to your DJI account and every application you do. Thank you, Trey. This is gonna be much easier to explain. Uh, so here you go. This is from Trey's phone, you guys can see this. Um, these lines here that come from the central point, that was a takeoff point, and then these uh, uh, kind of yellow areas, those are areas that you apply. And then up here, let's see, yeah, on the bottom, it says, you guys probably can't really see that, but it says 35 acres, um, 17 flights, and 72.85 gallons. And so you got your gallons per acre, you got your, um, and you got your acres right there. So this is a really great tool. Um, and this does it automatically, right, Trey? Yes. Yeah. So as long as you have everything set up on your remote, you know, correctly, once you get back to Wi-Fi, your remote uploads everything to the cloud. And then once it's on the cloud, it goes into this app, pull your app up, and you've got it right there. You can show your customers, screenshot it, send it over to them. Uh, you can print out reports. Um, there's another uh, program online, well, it's an online app, yeah, access through Google Chrome, uh, called the AGMS, Ag Management System. And the same information is available there. From there, you can get KML files, which you can then you know convert to shape files and stuff like that if customers need that information as well. So yes, you can deliver that to the customer um, so they know what they're getting. Hey Taylor, um, too. I had a couple. I had some issues actually with the um, the Smart Farm app, and so what we started doing was screenshotting it directly from the remote, and that did give you um, the same information. It was just a little bit more of a screen capture. So that's also another option. The platforms are great when they worked. I just had sometimes that there was just no data. It would show that I went out there, but it never showed my flight path from on the Smart Farm app. So. I think we use both, but just another option for people was a screenshot too. You bet. 
Yeah, I, there, there seem to be some random issues out there with the Smart Farm and the AGMS app. Um, and so thanks for sharing that, Zoe. Um, it seemed like some of these were resolved with, uh, there was a DJI change something in the middle of the season uh, where they didn't, they, everything used to automatically upload to the, to the cloud and they changed it to where it didn't automatically upload. So you had to check a box to make it automatically upload again. Um, so this fixed a lot of those problems, but I know there are some other random issues with, with Smart Farm as well. Um, so yeah, screenshotting works. And there are some, we have some, uh, some folks that are actually developing an app where you can pull this information directly from the remote uh, itself um, onto uh, your own uh, or a different GIS uh, software. So more to come on that. Uh, Niles says, what spare parts do you recommend to keep on hand? Yeah, um, so this depends, you know, props for sure. Trey, uh, do you, I mean, you didn't keep a whole lot of spare parts on hand, but what would you recommend? Rubber washers for the bank. Yeah. yeah, uh, rubber washers, he said, for the uh, the drain, the drain on the on the tank, <laughs> that, was, that was a common loss. Yeah, I say, um, so, everything. <laughs> yeah, and Zoe, Zoe kept one of everything. <laughs> uh, she also had four, four drones, so it does make more sense there. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so I think because you guys answered it, you know, so spray system, like, like Trey said, uh, is something you want to probably keep more spare parts on because again, if you're running through some gummy, gummy product, um, then you don't want to, you know, it's really frustrating whenever the drone flies, everything works, but your tips are clogged, your pumps are clogged or something like that because you've got to rinse out or using a bad a product that's, that's all that gelled up. So possibly some pumps, uh, right pump and nozzles with the T30, definitely props. And then, you know, really, uh, an ESC, excuse me, an ESC, probably a good idea, um, and possibly a motor. You know, we look at frame components. There's a, I mean, you could carry one of each arm and all of the components that go with the landing gear, everything like that, if you wanted to. That's absolutely something that is that you that you could do and might not be a bad idea. We're actually going to be offering um, here this winter uh, a, a program where you can. Uh, stock up on parts essentially um so you know if you've got you know we'll have basically a list of what we recommend if you want to be fully stocked on parts you know per drone like what you should have um it just depends how secure you want to be you know if you're doing custom application not a bad idea to have basically one of every, one of everything like zoe said uh, we do overnight ship just you know fyi if you have if you have problems we do overnight ship and so you can get it the next day uh how quick is it to obtain parts? I'm in the Quad Cities area. Yeah. So again, uh, Garrett, uh, we overnight. Um, we are we we are um, trying to develop a network of of dealers. Um, you know, our our goal is to have someone within you know really three four hours from the majority of our customers. Um, and we do have a, have somebody up your direction. Uh, so contact us about that. Um, um, here a bit later. Um, any word on the FAA certificate for the T40 from David? No, no concrete word. Um, so looks like you've looked into this, David. Um, so the FAA uh, for every new aircraft, every new large drone um, has to be approved by the FAA and DOT in Washington before anybody can get their exemption for it. Once it's approved, then yes, you can get a 4407 uh, for that aircraft. Um, so they have not approved it yet. Um, the FAA needs a lot of information, a lot of documents um, to get new aircraft approved. They have everything they need for the T-40. Uh, but as soon as they got everything they needed for the T-40, the person who was assigned to the T-40 got put on to a different assignment. Um, so now it's a new person taking over the T-40 assignment. And so that has slowed things down a bit. We were expecting by the end of the year now probably early next year is what we're looking at uh you know have no idea uh okay now it says how long is flight time with full load and without a load so a full load um basically across the models you're looking at uh about eight minutes or so like hovering with a full load empty load you're looking at about 15 a little over maybe uh, minutes with a full with an empty load 
Um, so somewhere between there, as you're spraying it out, as you're spraying that load out, then you get somewhere between there for flight time. Uh, the T10, you can use a T20 battery in it. And so if you want to use a small drone, the T10 for like spot spraying, use a T20 battery, you can get like 15 plus minutes of flight time with a load. So that, that's pretty cool. All right. Will you be at the NAAA convention, Robert? Robert says, uh, actually, yes, uh, I will personally be there, actually, at the NAAA convention. Um, yeah, not sure, sure what to expect there. I mean, you know, air applicators um, have difference in a, of, of opinion when it comes to drones, but, you know, it's our job to educate. Um, so that's that's one of the, we're going to three different conferences or conventions next, next week, and I picked that one. So I'll be there. I'll see you in person, Robert. Okay, does anyone know how to change the acres in hectares in the Android app? Uh, I don't the, like the like the farm the farmitude app, I assume we're talking about. Uh, I use hectares and liters on my drone. Okay. Acres. Okay, so you want you want uh, acres. Let's see, if the the DJI app. Yes, the DJI app on the remote or the DJI app on Smart Farm. Okay, on Smart Farm. Is it always in? There's a metric in Imperial. If yeah, you want. there you go. Yeah. yeah, under settings, metric and Imperial. I probably can't see that. Yeah, uh, you can change that. Yeah. Profile settings. Yeah. Profile settings. Profile settings. Yeah. Um, all right. Thank you for that one. All right. Uh, Niall says, does the map work off Google Maps that you fly off of, or do you have to fly above the field to get the images uh, before flying with your own self? So, yes. Um, you do have Google Maps background imagery um, on on the remote itself, so you can you can use that to drop your points um, around the outside of the field and make your your obstacles and everything. Um, on the T40, you can actually um, you know use the the actual camera on the drone, the remote uh, with the T40 to actually map and survey that area uh, up to uh, 33 acres, I think it is. Um, and then what it does is, if you're familiar with how dr how drones stitch imagery together, uh, basically it takes pictures of, the, of that area, 33 acres, um, and then stitches it all together on the remote, then overlays that onto the existing Google map on the existing imagery there. Um, so really useful for if you know if you if your Google map is outdated, and you pushed a tree out last year, tree still shows up there. Map that one area, there it goes. Um, or for field edges, you can have to do a field edge uh, run. Or for test plots, if you're doing test plots uh, and you want to fly, you know, right on long top of each of those strips um, or whatever you want to do there. But obviously, Google Map doesn't show you um, the the up to date test plot or the check blocks. Then map it out real quick with the T40, and then you can see up to date real time images overview of those check block and test plots. Um, so. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> Do you have any dealers near Idaho? Uh, working on one actually right now, um, uh, but nobody official yet. Um, probably be official sometime beginning of next year. Um, reach back out to us on that, Niles. Okay, Gabe says, I was told you have a program to begin work without the FAA aerial chem license until it is obtained is this the case okay uh fa aerial chem license i assume you mean the 137 uh not the like state applicators license gabe so yes we do have a program for the 137 and 44807 uh this works through pharmatude we don't actually offer it ourselves you know, our goal you know, when we look at agri-spray drones uh, as a whole, you know, our goal is, you know, our mission statement is to empower rural America. Uh, what that means is, you know, working with folks like Zoe um, and and Trey, you know, to help, you know, to basically establish, you know, new services and new areas, new businesses, new areas. 
Um, and best way to do that is to empower the people who are doing that. So I want you to have your own license, but understand there's a challenge here. And so we have partnered with Pharmatude um, and Pharmatude is doing this. Um, they're offering this service to our customers. So if you want more information about that, about how to work uh, through Pharmatude's um, 137 and how that works essentially is you work for them as a um, as a contract pilot essentially or contract operator yeah and they, they do the billing and stuff like that so reach back out to us on this and we can direct you over to pharma two to get you all the details on that all right yes i agree let's meet robert okay wow that was that was great guys uh that was awesome uh, I, I love it when there's a ton of questions, ton of engagement. I could talk about drones all day long and frequently do. Um, so anything else, Zoe or uh, Trey, that you guys have to add in here? No, Zoe? thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Zoe. Um, and yeah, these these two are open books. Uh, so, you know, if, if you have any burning questions, specific questions you've got, um, you know, we can get you in, in touch with them and they can they can answer something that, that you've that you've got a burning question on, as can we. Um, so looking forward. To, uh, yes. OK, yeah. Our con contact info is on our website. Yeah. Uh, Agrispraydrones.com. I, I think that wraps the question. So. That's it for us guys. Uh, sure appreciate everybody who stuck around for the hour and a half that we we're on here. Hope you guys learned something. Uh, if you want more info, uh, please reach out to us. We're happy to help as always. Thanks, have a good day.